I cannot say the title of this conference, Byzantium Modernism. The slash has an apophatic function. It makes manifest that which is ineffable. In SC, Roland Barthes, the structuralist analysis of Balzac's short story, Saracen, Bart writes, hence the slash confronting the S of Saracen and the Z of Sambinella has a panic function. It is the slash of censure, the surface of the mirror, the wall of hallucination, the verge of antithesis, the abstraction of limit, the obliquity of the signifier, the index of the paradigm, hence of meaning. Bart's statement captures the slash's ability to both unite and to separate the words which it suspends in silent adjacency. As such, the slash between Byzantium and modernism in our conference title could be seen as an evasion tactic on our part, a manner of eschewing all responsibility for this conference's findings and implications. If this was our intention, we surely failed. A word such as and would have better served that goal, or quite simply, any word. Instead, this slash is precisely the index of the paradigm as Bart describes it. For Bart, of course, the paradigm refers to the structuralist binary, the intervallic space that separates the signifiers into discrete parts and thus allows for signification. Thus, the slash in this instantiation of the interval points to the possibility for signification, since in the act of materializing that interval, the slash in turn manifests the entire logic of the structure. This interval, which the slash cuts through, thus produces a space where the encounter of Byzantium and modernism is possible, and by virtue of the entire structure of this conference. It visually manifests the paradox of signification before the signifier. The 11th century Byzantine philosopher Michael Pacellos understood the semiotic power of the interval when he wrote in his encyclopedic De Omnifara Doctrina that space is, according to the arithmeticians, the intelligible interval of numbers, like that in between one and two, two and three, and so on. For since the order of numbers is not continuous, but set in opposition, the intervals between numbers are named space. Pacellus extends this idea with a parallel metaphor to a container, writing, just as the vessel contains the wine and the wine is said to be circumscribed, the whole body of the vessel nevertheless does not receive the wine, but only the hollow circumference of it. This statement is in Pacellus' encyclopedia, the definition for Cora translatable as space, container, or land, previously used by Plato to describe the prototypical medium in the Timaeus. Cora is the receptacle of becoming. It is likened to the virgin wax upon which the form of the stamp may be impressed, a metaphor that in Byzantium takes double meaning in the virgin's body, both described as the virgin wax from which the Christ was formed, and as in the Akathistos hymn, the container of the uncontainable, a cora acoretu. Cora, in my mind, serves as a statement on the medium of the incarnation and thus speaks to the possibility for image production in the Byzantine world. The icon being dependent on the incarnation as the moment where the divine presence condescended to take on human form and thus allowed itself to be depicted by colors and line. However, it also speaks to the mediation of Byzantine art by an intervallic space between Byzantium and modernity, a distance which emerges not in continuity but rather in its opposition. Since the 19th century, artists, critics, and scholars have utilized the Byzantine as a manner of articulating the development of modernity in its image world. For example, Roger Fry coined the term proto-Byzantines to describe the post-impressionists and later Alfred Barr described Byzantine art and its iconic heritage as fundamental to the development of modern art designated as one of the prototypes and sources propelling his torpedo diagram for the Museum of Modern Art into the future. Perhaps most famously, these Byzantine parallels were articulated by Clement Greenberg in his 1958 article by the same title, which was selected as one of the essays included in his well-known Art and Culture volume. For Greenberg, the Byzantine is not an origin point for the teleological development of modernity, but instead, instead a tautological parallel the encounter and dialectic from which a formal logic of modernism could be derived. Much of the characteristics of modern art synonymous with Greenberg's name are discussed in, in the Byzantine Parallels essay. Greenberg writes, in late Roman and Byzantine art, the naturalistic devices of Greco-Roman painting were turned inside out to reaffirm the flatness of the pictorial space. Light and shade, the means par excellence of sculptural illusion, were stylized into flat patterns and used for decorative or quasi-abstract ends instead of illusionist ones. The power of cubism and of Byzantine mural art alike implies the wrench and the dialectic, 
by which a long and rich tradition has reversed its direction. Greenberg's analysis here speaks precisely to the drive of analytical cubism's articulation of space, its fracturing and superimposition of pictorial, pictorial planes and passage. His article astutely captures the spatial prolepsis of the Byzantine image, the manner in which it spills out into space and produces what Otto Damas in 1948 had described as a spatial icon in the mosaics at Daphne, and whose formal parallels could be seen earlier in the 1915 counter-release by Vladimir Tatlin that emerged from the logic and display of the Byzantine icon in its Russian descendant. Greenberg's writing expresses a prevalent logic and display of the Byzantine icon in its, sorry, Greenberg's writing expresses a prevalent logic of the formal homologies between Byzantine and modern art, a logic which is likewise manifested by the neo-Byzantine revival movements of the late and er, 19th and early 20th centuries. A nearby example of this model may be seen in the formal resonances between the 7th century Byzantine mosaics of St. Demetrius and Barry Faulkner's Intelligence Awakening Mankind mosaic from the 1260 Avenue of the Americas entrance of the GE building at Rockefeller Center, produced by the Ravenna Mosaics Company in 1933. The necessary question, however, is how does one move beyond such formal homologies? Or to return to the cubist example brought up by Greenberg, how does one deal with the events of October 1912, which included Picasso's creation of guitar, the subsequent advent of the papier collé, and thus the beginning of synthetic cubism? what Yves Lanbois and Rosalind Krauss have unified under the title, The Semiology of Cubism. While Clement Greenberg attributed the aniconic impulse of iconoclasm as an aesthetic drive, the iconoclastic debates were in fact a semiological controversy. And at the risk of sounding facetious, I would consider the art of the centuries following iconoclasm to be part of precisely a semiological project centered on the interrelated problems of space and signification. Byzantine iconoclasm in the 8th, 9th, and 11th centuries are all centered on moments in which the signified is confused with the referent, where the sign is believed to manifest the full presence of the divinity. Instead, the iconophiles reiterated that the icon exists as a space of desire, not a full presence. Not surprisingly, Lacan found resonances to his construction of the gaze and the objet petit a in the Pantocrator mosaics at Daphne. As an aside, I find it telling that Roman Jacobson recalls that when the Moscow Linguist Circle finally was able to read Saussure's general course, they believed that they had already learned its tenets by their familiarity with cubism. I am left to wonder what lessons had they learned even before that from the icon. Their lessons of cubism were, of course, formal, based on the constructions of representation and signification in the cubist pictorial field. I would like to imagine that had they considered the function of the icon in Byzantium, they would have been led to the lessons found in Derrida's yet in existence of grammatology, where the structure of the sign depends on difference, both the never annulled difference from the other which the sign signifies and the deferral encountered in its signification. This is the comprehension of this, this, this is the comprehension of the sign. This, this comp sorry, this comprehension of the sign is of course the orthodox limit of the icon in Byzantium whereby the image manifests a directed or present absence. The division of spoken words and written words depicted in the Rockefeller Center mosaic speaks to the division between speech and writing, here unified by its signified thought. However, it also directly addresses the rise of technologies that allowed for the dissemination of knowledge, namely radio, given its location in the entry to the then Radio Corporation of America, or ICEA building. The Byzantine, in its formal and conceptual parallels, has served in Greenberg's words as the wrench in the dialectic in articulating the rise of new media technologies. This is perhaps most vividly demonstrated in two portraits of Marshall McLuhan that depict him with a book open to the mosaic programs of Hagia Sophia. Carefully staged, these images draw primary importance to the Byzantine and McLuhan's conception of new media and the global image. Comparing these two other portraits of McLuhan, the Byzantine Comparing these two other portraits of McLuhan, the Byzantine seems to mediate the virality and feedback of the technological image, or at least as its prehistory, which McLuhan, as the great image theorist of his moment, pours over as if in the midst of his research. However, such an image begs us to question whether this is merely an idiosyncratic or passing reference, and furthermore, what is the place of the Byzantine icon in relation to modernity's new media and technology? 
This interest in Byzantium continued well into the 1990s as demonstrated in the promotional copy of Billy Idol's 1990 Charm Life album. Designed by Randall Martin, the cover features an image of Billy Idol as an icon with silver revetment, a manifestation of the icon seen in Byzantium and particularly in the post-Byzantine Russian world. In conversations with its designer, Martin explained to me that the cover originates from seeing silver-covered icons on sale on Fifth Avenue in New York in the late 80s. The icon cover was a clever play on Billy Idol's name and a spoof of the gothic fascinations of punk rock albums in the 80s, whose imagery conveyed visions of a loud, fiery hell. At the time, Martin wrote in our exchange, computers were just starting to be used for graphic design, and like the arts and crafts movement reacting to modernism, I was interested in creating images that were obviously handmade. I find his deployment of the icon an interesting choice as a site of resistance against a computer-made mechanical image. Here we find an articulation of the icon that strives not for being perceived as an image not made by human hands, the Akeropoeton of Byzantium, or as manifesting the divine presence that is beyond the skill and craft of the artist, as the notion of Msikos Grafe or insult painting articulated itself from Michael Pacellos. Here the icon in its silver repousse materiality embodies the hand of the artist, that which works against the modern medium. Nevertheless, Upon opening of this cover, by stripping the icon of its revetment, the image of the idol reveals the double bind implicit in this artifact. The divinity of the image is not found in the analog production of the illusionistic revetment, but rather in the shimmering light of the digital halo, the CD that pokes through that which contains the sonic presence of idol, s serves as the halo of the photographic image. As such, this object reveals the tensions of our recent past articulated through the Byzantine. At once, it is an act of defiance, of resisting new media, new ideas, and new systems of belief through an allusion to analog artistic productions, while also revealing the mysterious and quasi-divine workings of digital representation. The case is similar with Andy Warhol's Gold Marilyn Monroe from 1962, where Marilyn is depicted as an icon after her death. The work manifests a Byzantine iconicity articulated through the rhetoric of 15 minutes of fame, Hollywood film studios, and the devotional following of the cult figure's celluloid image. Parallel tensions can be seen in contemporary images from pop culture, such as a Byzantine icon of Luke, photoshopped with the image of Rick Santorum on The Colbert Show recently. Or, my favorite, the Byzantinizing Theodora-like headdress of Lady Gaga as she, Jesus, and the 12 apostles ride on a Los Angeles freeway in the opening of her 2011 music video, Judas. These images speak at first glance to the Byzantines' association with iconicity and celebrity, the religious and the secular, and the tensions which such systems create. However, they also speak to a contestation over the ideological terrain enacted by the icon, the terrestrial rule of the image in a digital world where repetition and virality open new epistemic areas of artistic production. I wish to conclude with an image from Anselm Kiefer's 1980 iconoclastic controversy series. In this picture, tanks bearing the names of the iconoclastic emperors and patriarch of Byzantium are seen closing upon a circumscribed terrain inscribed with the names of 8th and 9th century iconophile theologians and imperial members. Kiefer's work struggles with post-World War II trauma and memory, particularly in Germany. In this image, the painter's slash palette becomes the space of the image contestation the receptacle of the image becoming, or simply, Cora in my mind. In sketching any introduction to Byzantium modernism, I was destined to fail or to make vulgar climbs against the subjects I wished to represent. Yet in a conference devoted to the slash, this failure was both inevitable and necessary. In the days that follow, it is necessary to ask how we construct a discursive space between Byzantium modernism how the enduring reemergence of the Byzantine plays into the narratives of modernity and its art, and consider what both modernism and Byzantium have to gain from this mutual translation. Thank you.